Hello and welcome to Talking Tudors, a fortnightly podcast about the ever-fascinating Tudor dynasty. My name is Natalie Gruniger and I'll be your host and guide on this journey through 16th century England. Are you ready to step through the veil of time into the dazzling and dangerous world of the Tudor court? Without further ado, it's time to talk Tudors. everyone welcome back to talking tutors episode 129 i'm your host natalie gruninger and i'm so glad that you could join me before we move on to today's episode i have some very exciting news to share with you just last week i launched a line of talking tutors merchandise there are a number of designs and products available including phone cases notebooks and apparel New items will also be added over time. If you'd like to show your support of the podcast, head over to talkingtutors.threadless.com. You'll also find links on my social media accounts. I'd absolutely love to see pics of you wearing your Talking Tutors merch, so please do tag me on social media and use the hashtag I love Talking Tutors. I'd also, of course, like to acknowledge and thank the wonderful listeners who continue to support this podcast via Podbean Patron and extend a heartfelt thank you to everyone who's taken the time to rate and review the show. This really does make a difference. If you love the podcast and tune into every episode, perhaps you'd consider becoming a Talking Tudors patron. Just click on the Be My Patron on Podbean badge on the homepage of my website on thetudortrail.com or click on the Be A Patron button on the Podbean app. Join the Talking Tudors patron family, and in addition to receiving lots of Tudor-themed goodies, you'll be automatically entered into our patron-only monthly giveaways. September's prize is an Elizabeth I acrylic block, the perfect addition to any bookshelf, desk, or study. Thank you so much to Philippa from British History Tours for sponsoring this wonderful prize. All patrons are also eligible to attend monthly Talking Tudors live talks, which take place on Zoom. These events are exclusive to patrons. Next month, I'll be chatting to historian Gareth Russell about Catherine Howard and the Tudor Queen's consort. Please get in touch with me if you'd like to register for the event. Now, on to today's episode. I'm so excited that joining me on the show to talk about courtly love at the Tudor court is Sarah Griswood. Sarah's new book, The Tudors in Love, takes one of history's most popular dynasties and reveals for the first time how it was both made and marred by chivalric romance. From Henry VIII declaring himself as the loyal and most assured servant of Anne Boleyn to Elizabeth I's poems to her suitors, the Tudors reenacted the roles of the devoted lovers and capricious mistresses first laid out in the romances of medieval literature. Sarah is the author of four previous books of 15th and 16th century history. A former journalist contributing to papers such as The Guardian and The Telegraph, she's also written a number of books on 20th century subjects. She features frequently at history festivals and on radio and television, discussing the past and present of Britain's monarchy. Our conversation's coming straight up after this short musical break, courtesy of guitarist John Sayles. (laughs) 
welcome back to Talking Tutors, Sarah. How are you? Well, thank you. And thank you for having me back. Oh, it's wonderful to have you back on the show. Now, it has been a little while since we last chatted. Mm -hmm. So perhaps why don't we start with an introduction and you just telling our listeners a little bit about yourself? Okay, I guess. Well, I'm a Tudor biographer, historical biographer is the way I usually put it. I never quite dare to call myself a historian. That always feels a little cheeky as it were. I was, for many years, I was a journalist, so I'm above all a writer, but I've always been fascinated by, let's not say obsessed with, the Tudor period. So when I did my first historical biography, all 20 years now ago now, it was always going to be of a Tudor, even if her surname was Stuart, Arbella Stuart, and I've gone on from there. Wonderful. And I I wanted to talk to you a little bit about your your latest book. So I'd love it if you could just tell us a little bit about this. And this is The Tudors in Love, The Courtly Code Behind the Last Medieval Dynasty. Yes. Well, this is it's it's quite a personal one for me. I mean, my last book, Game of Queens, was really kind of looking very much at the political side of the women of the 16th century, the powerful women. This one, well, although of course it is about the Tudors in love, really the key is in that subtitle. I've always been very much aware of this romantic idea, you know, dating from the Middle Ages, which I'd say still affects us today. And that idea is courtly love. I'd say, that it absolutely coloured the Tudors' behaviour. That on the one hand, they were dynasty in love with the idea of loving. On the other hand, they absolutely, in different ways, made use of its patterns, its tropes. And it seemed to me that if one could look at that, look at the Tudors through that angle, in a way, you could come up with an explanation perhaps for some of the the behavior patterns of theirs, which so fascinate us, but which still puzzle us today. It's a different way of looking at the Tudors. And of course, I hope that it'll, you know, it'll help us to look also at this, this strange but pervasive idea. Yes, and we're going to talk a little bit more later in our conversation about some specific sort of events and relationships. But before we we delve any any further, you've mentioned that, of course, the book centers around this importance of courtly love, but that's a, mm. such a tricky concept I find to define. So how would you, Sarah, explain it? And what were some of the rules or conventions? Yeah, I mean, it totally is. That, of course, was the challenge for me. That's why, you know, we have the f- sort of three chapters effectively exploring the history of courtly love, because, of course, it's a history of which the Tudors themselves were very much aware. And in a sense, you know, looking at it, looking at the old artefacts, the manuscripts and so on that explain it, we're looking as they did. We're consuming a historical culture as they did. And, you know, in a sense, maybe you even get to to peek out from behind their eyes a bit. But courtly love. It was born in the all oh, the late 12th century. Think of the court of Marie de Champagne, Eleanor of Aquitaine's daughter by you know her first marriage to the King of France. There she commissioned Chrétien de Troyes to write for the first time the story of Lancelot and Guinevere and an adulterous love which yet saw the lovers absolutely honoured for their ardour, which is very strange when you come to think about it. I mean, Lancelot genuflects when he leaves Guinevere's chamber, as if he's at a a, a holy shrine. He adores, he finds a comb of hers, discarded by the side of the road with a few hairs, her hairs caught in it, and falls to worshipping it. I mean, you know, today you'd tell him to seek professional help fairly quickly. But nonetheless, this idea, even when, you know, when it was being sent up, as sometimes it was, gripped the imagination of Europe, aristocratic Europe, 
for centuries. And it may also have been at Marie de Champagne's court that one Andreas Capellanus, Andrew the chaplain, sat down to write a book on loving where he actually laid down, and I do mean rules, for this spiritual, pure love. I mean, you know, rules like there's there's nothing you, you, you shouldn't do for your beloved. A lot of those rules I found quite interesting when it came to when if you try and apply them to Henry VIII's marital history. Rules like, you know, one love casts out another, that there is an element of jealousy in all true love. And it went on. You know, for the next centuries, you can see this idea, the central idea was Imagine a picture in your head, a knight kneeling, a, a lover, a nobleman, kneeling in service before a lady. Beautiful lady, aren't they all, you know, but probably older than he, probably higher up the social scale than he, and probably already married to someone else. Andreas Capellanus imagined, described, um, Marie and her mother, Eleanor and others, presiding over actual courts of love, you know, where they discuss knotty points such as was true love even possible within marriage? Marie decided it was not It was not. Now, I don't think anyone today really believes that such courts actually existed then. But nonetheless, there was a real emotional reality behind the idea or it wouldn't have stuck around. Because you can see it, you know, on and on and on. In the 13th century, the church, late 13th, so 100 years on, the church felt it necessary to condemn the writings of Andreas Capellanus. The great medieval bestseller, The Roman de la Rose, was all about courtly love. Dante, Petrarch, Chaucer, all made use of it to some degree. Christine de Pisa critiqued it from what you can really only call a, a proto-feminist standpoint. But nonetheless, it was still absolutely there when the, the Tudors, you know, began to loom up on the scene, the more so because it had become so inextricably linked with the Arthurian stories. And Sarah, when did this term courtly love come into play? Was there a, a way of describing it then? Was there a term or is this just a modern thing that we've, we've um, brought up? The actual words courtly love are usually credited to a French writer of the late 19th century. The 19th century saw a huge revival in the ideas of chivalry and courtly love. But hence that picture of the lady and the knight that's in all our heads. It's not usually really a medieval one. It's a nice Victorian fantasy. <laughs> but in fact, I found it uh, used twice in the work of a, a late Elizabethan writer. And of course, the, the Middle Ages had many terms, you know, it's born in France. So amour courtois, you know, fin amour, fine love. But yeah. court love as such is a little bit of a, a little bit later. Yeah. Can you tell us some practical ways that this, this idea, this framework mm. governed how men and women are interacting at the Tudor court? Yes, well, indeed, I think one has first of all to remember that the world of, of the court, the Tudor court, like the medieval castle, was in no sense equally balanced between the sexes. We tend to forget that now. You know, our recent tradition has seen women doing housework and so on. But in fact, of course, that the court and the castle would have been massively slated to what men might have outnumbered women by as much as, you know, by 10 to 1. So really, there was no possibility for what you might call a kind of what we'd see as a kind of 50-50 straight give and take. It was going to be all about ways courtly love, the ideas of courtly love offered a number of opportunities. They offered young men a way to rise, perhaps through the patronage of a powerful woman. They offered this idea of nobility through worth, not birth. So, of course, we see it at the Tudor court. Well, one way we see it very clearly would be in the tournaments, in the pageants. Of course, that was all about this, this chivalric fantasy. You know, think of Henry VIII in the early days of his marriage, jousting, you know, wearing cour loyal, so loyal heart, Catherine of Aragon's initial, you know, on his, 
his horse's trappings, even making his horse beat the wooden barriers with its hooves whenever he passed by her. This was all about a man, a knight, as Henry saw himself, in service to a lady. And of course, when young men might cluster around a queen, say, Anne Boleyn, they might, by the rules of courtly love, have expected perhaps to get some rewards in terms of patronage, position, but to pay for it with a ritual tribute of admiration. And sorry, I may be jumping the gun here, but I I can't resist one, of course, one of our big questions, which, you know, all of your listeners and followers will have often, you know, debated themselves, is whether that's what was going on in Anne Boleyn's chamber, whether that, in the end, is what even brought her to her death. Yes, and we're going to come back to that because I want to talk to you a little bit more about that. That's quite fascinating. But I also, I'm quite fascinated to learn about how people in the 16th century actually learned about these codes. Is this something that's very explicitly taught? Are you sitting down to a lesson or is it more that you're immersed in this whole culture? Could you talk to us a little bit about that? And of course, you know, I have to say this was the aristocratic, the reading classes. But nonetheless, I was about to say, you know, you wouldn't sit down to a lesson, but it's not that far off it, you know. There is, if you look at the education of, for example, the young Henry VIII, and particular, particularly his younger sister Mary, the tutors hired for them, the books, manuscripts in the Royal Library, make it very clear that they would have had access to these stories, to these ideas. And there were, you know, one one real genre of literature, 15th and early 16th century, was manuscripts of instruction and manuscripts of instruction for princes, particularly. We know Machiavelli, we think of Machiavelli, but there were, you know, umpteen more. Often, many of them instructing you on how to be a good knight a good man and many of them also brought in the idea of how to be a good lover to take one castiglione's baldassare castiglione's book of the courtier published written earlier of course translated into english about three years into elizabeth's reign specifically said that if the you know the noble lady accepts the love of the worthy courtier they may both attain absolute perfection. This was almost a kind of moral idea. The idea was that the the knight, the lover, would gain both by the purity of his feelings and by his lady's example. And I think that's very important when you come to consider the behaviour of Henry VIII and of his daughter Elizabeth in a different way. And I wanted to ask you also about how this concept and you've touched on this a little bit, but maybe you can delve a little bit more, how courtly love is represented in literature and publications of the day. Mm -hmm. Can you touch on that a little bit? Yes. Well, of course, here we are getting on to the Arthurian stories, to which we know the Tudors would have had access. You know, they were there. Indeed, there's a there's a um, there was a volume of Arthurian romances in the Royal Library with the signatures of both Elizabeth Woodville and Elizabeth of York on it, and we know that Elizabeth of York, you know, taught her children. But the Arthurian stories had been very present, very active throughout the Middle Ages. And may I talk a bit about now about that? Yes, the, the, please the, do. Okay, because the Arthur, on the one hand, of course, you had this strange question of the adulterous love of Lancelot and Guinevere, which, you know, could wind up by bringing down Camelot, but yet at the same time, it left, you know, both lovers on a kind of, you know, pedestal to be admired. And, I mean, I can't tell you how many times the Arthurian stories were rewritten, revamped, redeveloped throughout the Middle Ages. But one thing that interested me particularly was the way they kept on being of use to the English royal family. Back 1190, the monks at Glastonbury rediscovered, they said, discovered in their grounds the tombs of Arthur and Guinevere. Now, the real royals of the day, you know, rushed to the scene. Why? 
Well, King Henry II was, of course, the first Plantagenet king. You know, he was, it was a time the throne had been contested. He was founding effectively a new dynasty. And what better way to give it legitimacy than to link himself to the mythical, the great King Arthur, whose existence was taken as being history, not, not just legend. I mean, when Edward, when the Hammer of the Scots, you know, many years on, um, wrote, wanted to claim sovereignty over the whole British Isles, he wrote to the Pope saying he should be the King of all Britain, just as his ancestor, King Arthur had done. And when can we see this being used again very clearly? Well, 1485, and what happened in 1485? Two things, actually. One is that William Caxton printed The Mort d'Arthur by Thomas Mallory, you know, written a decade or so beforehand. And this really sort of brought together uh, all the strands of Arthurian writing and carried them on. It's still what we, what we know, even if we don't know we know it today. I mean, Mallory's writing was the source of T.H. White, which was the source of Camelot, the movie and the musical. And as I say, printed 1485. Henry Tudor, let's remember, had grown up in first in Wales, where these stories were born, and then uh, in Brittany and in France for many years, where there was again a huge Arthurian culture. And before Bosworth, he adopted as his standard the, the Red Dragon Dreadful. It's the Rouge Dragon Dreadful. It's, yes, it's the Red Dragon of Wales, but Thomas, but Mallory had also written how King Arthur dreamt of a dragon beating down a tyrant boar. Who had the boar as their symbol? Richard III did. And as we all know, you know, Henry made sure his eldest son was named Arthur, that he was born at Winchester, which Mallory had identified as Camelot. And, you know, even when, oh, when Philip of Burgundy, who was this kind of, you know, hot happening chivalric star of the tournament, was blown onto English shores and visited Henry, Henry made sure the first thing he showed him, the most important thing, was the round table, Arthur's round table, hanging in Winchester Castle. Yes, and that's the one that I think um, Henry VIII had his head painted on, didn't he? Absolutely, yes. <laughs> so obviously we see Henry is also using these stories well, and manipulating them. Yes, we do. Uh, and it was a kind of common currency through, uh, through Europe. You know, reports of the uh, ambassador's reports of the young King Henry say that, you know, for nobility and fame, he's greater than any prince since King Arthur. Later on, indeed, um, there's one very specific use of the Arthurian story that interested me. Ye you know, years on, even after the, the fall of Anne Boleyn, about which we'll speak, the Duke of Norfolk can be felt, who we don't usually think of as Mr. Romance, do we? <laughs> but can be, <laughs> can be found telling, I think it was the Venetian envoys, that King Henry's break from the Church of Rome was perfectly fine. It had precedent, and he cited King Arthur's supposed victory over the Roman Empire. So the ideas were around and in currency, even by, um, you know, with people who you really don't think of as going home to curl up with a good romance. Yeah, that's a different perspective on the Duke of Norfolk, Sarah. Definitely I haven't thought of him like that before. Now, let's, let's take a look at some of these events and relationships with our courtly love lenses, you know, glasses on. So what can we learn, for example, when we look at Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn's relationship mm -hmm. through this lens? Yes, well, that's the biggie, of course. I mean, I think it played a part at first, even in, um, in Henry's relationship with Catherine of Aragon, who we have to remember when Henry came to the throne was still a young, glamorous figure, five or six years older than Henry, yes, but at that point, that would have been wholly an advantage, would just have made her look like this, you know, attractive woman of the world. And I think the speed with which Henry rushed to marry her, you know, the minute his father died and he came to the throne, does rather, rather suggest, we think he, he probably had a kind of rescue fantasy about her. Catherine had had this very 
hard time during the last years of Henry VII's reign, you know, after the death of Prince Arthur. You know, was she half a widow, half Henry's future wife, you know, living in, in poverty and some despair? Now, suddenly, the 18-year-old Henry XVII swooped down and married her, and by the sound of it, did sort of, you know, persuade himself into adoring her for a time. You know, as, as we said, he, you know, he rode as her knight, he, you know, he, he'd meet ambassadors in her chamber, all that kind of thing. And it does really did seem, you know, like a, he wrote, I love true where I did marry. But the trouble is, in a sense, courtly love was never really equipped to deal with too many of the harsh realities. I'd say that's that's the real trap there, you know, for, for women in a way. And it's one that Catherine of Aragon got caught in because as she began to age and, of course, was not able to give, as he saw it, give Henry the son he so desperately craved, the rules of courtly love basically allowed him to look elsewhere, not just for, you know, a, a mistress in the regular sense, but even also for a, a courtly mistress. Um, NB, that are actually Bessie Blount, and I think the fact that we call her Bessie is a bit dismissive in a way, but Bessie Blount, the mistress who did give the, the king a son before Anne Boleyn came onto the scene, she was actually notably well-read cultured, had, by the sounds of it, considerable courtly training. But there we have, we have Henry. Anne Boleyn's first recorded appearance at the English court is, of course, in the context of a piece of fantasy pageantry. 1522, the siege, the um, march, York Place, the tournaments, the grand tournaments, which were all about the heart, all the jousters, they, they, you know, they had symbols of the heart. One of them rode with a motto of my heart between love and pain. Another one had the motto, my heart is wounded. Uh, King Henry himself, in fact, you know, rode under the motto, she hath wounded my heart. And, you know, there were hearts rent asunder, hearts everywhere. After the tournaments, there were, of course, the masks, and there was the siege of the Chateau Vert. Green painted castle, three towers, with eight ladies there to defend it. Knights assaulted, throwing dates and oranges. Uh, the ladies fought back with fought back with comfits and rose water, while real cannon boomed from outside. Now, among the knights was, of course, guess who? King Henry. The ladies, well, there was the king's sister, Mary Tudor. There was Mary Boleyn. There was also playing the role of perseverance, Anne Boleyn. And it, it does seem, you know, it seems strike. And it was at this point that Anne Boleyn appears on the English court. I think, of course, we don't know quite at what point, you know, Henry's real interest in her began. Not immediately, but it it does seem, um, and here of course the you know the poetry of Thomas Wyatt is one of our clues, as if Anne, the continental education Anne had had, which would have given her a good training in the, these these matters of these theories of courtly love, would, and given her a real sort of courtly gloss, made her a star, the English court. And when Henry begins writing to her, those 16 love letters of his that we still have, you know, preserved in the Vatican archive, he is absolutely delightedly flexing his muscles as a courtly suitor. He's, although he's the king, he's writing, you know, to Anne as her servant you know, ready to do her service, homage, that he writes, my heart and I surrender ourselves to you. He calls her, his, begs her to be his mistress. And of course, there's the possible dual sense here, mistress in the sexual sense, mistress in the courtly one. But it really does look as though Henry was thoroughly enjoying himself. Henry was a role player, of course. We know that from his love of, you know, masks, pageantry, disguise. Here he was playing the courtly suitor in pursuit of an unattainable mistress. And really, we all know that that's how the relationship of Anne Boleyn and Henry, you know, played out. But this is, this is the ground route that made it possible. 
this idea. It is quite odd, actually. We don't know precise timings, but it looks as if the time from when Henry began his serious pursuit of Anne to full consummation of their their love, you know, her becoming pregnant, was something like seven years. Mallory, Thomas Mallory in The Mort d'Arthur, had written how once upon a time men and women could love together seven years without having to consummate it. There's all sorts of these, these strange echoes. And of course, it was this idea also that, that courtly love and chivalry made possible of, of nobility of worth, not birth, that also made Anne's extraordinary rise possible. I mean, obviously, we know she wasn't the girl from nowhere often painted, you know, her uncle was the Duke of Norfolk and so on. But nonetheless, you could see Thomas Wolsey writing letters when, when he'd been, you know, brought in on the act, saying that the reason Henry wanted to marry Anne and listing all her virtues, that that's what made her worthy to be the king's wife. So really, these rules, these rules of this strange but time-honoured creed are kind of what gave sanction to their love and made Henry feel that because his love for Anne was, you know, was so strong, it was, it was morally viable. He wasn't doing anything wrong in abandoning Catherine of Aragon, in moving on. It, it gave a lot of license just where it was needed. I'm sorry, I'm answering at such length. Do forgive me. No, that was wonderful. And, and I must say, it just makes perfect sense, doesn't it? And it really oh, it goes a long way yeah. to explaining... Um, However, and what Sarah, something happens when they get married. There's a there's a transition, yeah. there's a change. So do you want to move into that chapter of their life, I suppose, yeah. and, and maybe talk about how the downfall came about or how we can view it with these, you know, the lens of courtly love? Yes. That well indeed, one of those huge questions is what brought about the downfall of Anne Boleyn. We're all still debating it, aren't we? And probably the answer, true, probably the true answer is a perfect storm of circumstances. You know, Henry's ongoing desire for a son, faction at court, Thomas Cromwell and Anne's dissent over the dissolution of the monasteries. But it's nonetheless notable the terms in which accusations against her would be couched. Now, work in, in recent years has often tended towards playing up the, the fervour of Anne Boleyn's religious reforming zeal, and rightly so. But sitting alongside that, and I don't think contemporaries would have seen any oddity about this, was also this sort of, there was talk of lighter matters, of quote, pastime in the Queen's chambers. You know, the courtier writing that clearly, you know, from the pastime in the Queen's chambers, any old lovers were forgotten. You know, there was music and dancing, which of course were, you know, major transmitters of the courtly tradition. There were tiny things I found, like um, one of the great 15th century courtly love poems, La Belle Dame Sans Merci, not the Keats one, um, a much, much, very different version, was suddenly translate, was produced into English, edited into English by a man, Thin, the Longleat family, who the next year turns up, up as Anne Boleyn's cofferer. You know, so her circles were full of that kind of literary talk. Of course, one of the inhabitants of Anne's chamber as queen was Margaret Douglas, the king's niece, who was one of the chief orchestrators of behind the Devonshire manuscript, that kind of WhatsApp group of courtly poetry, you know, which, which, which indeed she herself would wind up in the tower right after Anne's fall, wouldn't she, for an unsanctioned love affair. So there obviously was this kind of rather fer fervent and fervid literary atmosphere of romance still continued in Anne's chamber as queen. Now, when she was Henry's lover, sexually or otherwise, it worked just fine. But his wife was supposed to have different rules. I mean, it's a slightly, it would be a slightly old fashioned view to say that that's, that was the real, the whole reason behind Anne's fall. But what I would argue is that it certainly provided a language for it, if you like, that this whole idea 
of a creed that actually sanctioned, promoted adultery would have been a weapon to Thomas Cromwell's hands. You know, it, it, would, it would give an excuse for attacking her. And of course, there were those flirtatious remarks, you know, men like Weston and Norris, Smeaton even, paying this kind of ritual tribute of admiration. Oh, who do I love? Of course, it's yourself, madam. But which then could be seized on and taken so bitterly the wrong way. Even on her way to the tower, and she, she said, didn't she, that she expressed the hope that Henry was merely trying to test her. That test game is a huge courtly love thing, that, you know, the lover will test his beloved. Heaven knows, we all know that was, you know, very far from the case. Even, even that strange, that one-off decision of Henry's that Anne should die by the sword, um, not the axe. The sword was a very potent symbol of chivalry, you know, think Excalibur. Uh, this code against which she'd used, but against which Henry came to feel she'd offended. And when you hear of Anne saying, you know, describe predictions that a Queen of England would be burnt, you can, or hoping that she might be allowed to retire to a convent, surely somewhere at the back of her mind was Arthur's Queen Guinevere, sentenced either to the flames or to a nunnery. Yeah, she makes that heartbreaking um, comment quite late in the piece as well to, to Kingston that she is in hope of life, which I think is I terribly know. heartbreaking, isn't it? Oh, goodness. Um, and, and do you think that atmosphere that you were describing um, in Anne's chamber that may have sort of fueled the fire or, or, or provided the context for these accusations, would they have been taking place in Catherine of Aragon's um, household as well and seen a little bit differently because of her, of uh -huh. course, pristine reputation? Yeah. Good question. I rather think not. No, I rather, no, I suspect not. I mean, yes, perhaps to some degree, but not perhaps with Catherine herself as a very active participant. There seems to be very little evidence of Catherine herself showing any great interest in playing courtly games. I mean, she was the kind of recipient of them, the passive, the observer, you know, whenever Henry and his men burst into her chamber, you know, disguised unconvincingly as heaven knows what. She, like her ladies, took care to be astonished. She'll have known the rules, but there isn't much evidence. I think she, she marched to a different drummer, you know? Yeah, that's really interesting. So can we talk a little bit about Catherine Howard? Mm. What can we learn from her story? Well, Catherine Howard, perhaps, but of course, also, of course, Anne of Cleves. Yes. Um, it, it is kind of notable that the one time Henry tried to make a, the normal political kind of marriage, it didn't work. And again, he's going down to Rocha in disguise. Oh, did the man ever get tired of dressing up? You know, to, to, to surprise her on her journey was a recognised courtly game true love was supposed to see through all disguises. Unfortunately, Anne of Cleves had no training to play the game. Now, did Catherine Howard? We know she didn't get a huge amount of education. She appears to have been, you know, the, the normal The normal thinking sees her as something of a flibbity gibbet, didn't it? On the other hand, one of the major sort of transmitters of courtly love idea was music. And if, one, if there's one thing we do know about Cat, Cat Howard's um, education. It's that she was tutored in music because it was, of course, her music master, one of those who it suggested, you know, it had illicit relations with her. I'm not, I, myself, I, I don't really feel that Henry's huge effect, you know, indulgence for passion for, for Catherine Howard was really couched in courtly terms. It was pretty obvious who was you know, in who was top dog here, and it wasn't Catherine, it was Henry. Where it may come in, more interestingly, is that that damning letter that Catherine Howard wrote to Thomas Culpepper, which seems to be protesting her undying love, her ardent love for him. The idea has been raised, and very interestingly, that actually she was trying, she was almost trying to write a courtly piece of dialogue that these these ardent phrases of you know how how she 
can't bear to live without him and so on, came effectively from the courtly handbook. I'm not sure if I'm totally convinced by that, to be honest. I think that by this point, Henry's interest had largely moved away from, you know, the old creeds. But it still it, it still keeps on raising its spectral head to a degree to be yep. reborn, of course. Yes, yeah. yes. And talking oh. about being reborn, let's move forward a little bit into the reign of Elizabeth I. Yes. So do we see her adopting these ideas and manipulating them to her benefit as well? Yes, totally and utterly, in a rather different way, however, to the way her parents had used them. Because after all, she was in a very different position to Anne Boleyn or most of you know the other court. She when when Elizabeth came to the throne, of course, there was still huge debate about the question of a female sovereign. We'd had her sister Mary, but A Mary wasn't around that long, and also Mary married. And as a Catholic, she was herself, in a sense, under the spiritual authority of, of Rome. Elizabeth, when she we, we think of her as the Virgin Queen, that's hindsight as far as her early reign is concerned. At the time, of course, everyone thought she would and must marry. When she didn't, when it became apparent that she really was treading this very unique path there needed again it, it it's a language or there needed to be a kind of coding for her unmarried female monarchy we know how she used elizabeth and those around her used images you know like the virgin mary classical mythology but it's when you look at the patterns of courtly love that they fit elizabeth elizabeth's relations with her courtier courtiers and even her country really almost precisely. I mean those excessively ardent protestations of love that Elizabeth's courtiers made to her. And you, you wonder how they could do it with a straight face. Well they got the language of courtly love, had been, been doing it for centuries. It, it gave license, it made, I mean it made the men look admirable you know worthy lovers rather than just plain ludicrous you know because the court the courtly lover was supposed to go on a, a adoring his high unattainable mistress whether or not she ever reciprocated so that this creed gave license also to elizabeth's own pleasurably flirtatious behavior but more than that you think the courtly lady well, she was supposed to be capricious and demanding. Gee, Elizabeth was never going to have any problems with that one, was she? She was supposed also to give a kind of moral example. Well, you didn't get much higher as a moral example than the queen who the ritual of the coronation had allied to God and who was supposed to be giving moral example to her whole country. The language, everything is there. And um, again, there came even, Arthur had rather fallen out of fashion, but in the midpoint of, of Elizabeth's reign, less Elizabeth herself than some of those, you know, those around her, there was even a kind of new interest in Elizabeth's descent from King Arthur. The Cecils kept a family tree showing it. You know, really, it, it does fit, the, it explains again, as nothing else does quite to us in emotional terms, you know, just, just how Elizabeth and her courtiers manage this very strange juggling act. Yes, it's, it's really fascinating. And I'm just thinking that it does make it tricky to assess when you're looking at these relationships, Henry and Anne, for example, just as a, a sort of famous one, his love letters, for example, to assess how genuine were his feelings and how much well, is yeah. courtly love. Well, that's a very good point. Because we know that Henry, it's a very good point, because we know that Henry, he was aspirational, if you like. You know, he wanted to see himself, he wanted to be able to admire himself, especially the young Henry, and see himself fitting into various roles. So I think when he wrote, first began writing those letters to Anne, often NB in French, you know, the, the language of courtly love, I think to some degree he was playing a role and enjoying it. But, you know, then other factors began to merge, other possibilities even from that, that courtly creed. 
Yes, you're talking about him playing roles and I'm picturing him in his Robin Hood outfit that he wore oh. on several May days. <laughs> I know, I know. Oh, he's, he's a funny a guy, isn't he? Goodness yeah. me. All right, well, let's. I have one more question for you and that is how do you think courtly love influences how we see relationships and how men and women interact today? I think it, it totally does because I think a lot of the ideas of courtly love came to inform our whole broader idea of romance a lot of those ideas that you know love at first sight that love ennobles that loving hurts you can see them back in the 12th century you know in those writings of Andreas Capellanus and you know there was there was this huge revival of the ideas of chivalry of interest in all things medieval and specifically in courtly love in the the romantic and the victorian eras you know i mean even disraeli addressed queen victoria as the the fairy thinking of you know spencer's fairy queen anything less like a fairy than the age in victoria <laughs> but you know let that one pass i mean they had they had tournaments queens of beauty you know revisited all the old arthurian stories and i think that's what's come down to us i think if you like courtly love has come to us filtered through the victorian prism but come it has it's interesting that never mind camelot the movie and the musical you know gently sending it up but then they were sending it up for centuries but believing it at the same time think of a film like oh like a knight's tale Heath Ledger there, there's a right again back in the 12th century a story that Chrétien de Troyes invented of Guinevere telling Lancelot to prove his love by doing not his best but his worst in the tournament happens in a knight's tale it's and it's as if we all somehow recognize those ideas tell you how we really you really know it's still there it might seem a bit of a reach from the age of chivalry to a box of chocolates and indeed you know it's possible that that, that listeners in other countries won't know the brand but very famous set of adverts in in britain they were there in my childhood redone recently a knightly figure i mean a, a daring do man good looking in a rugged way plunging through absurd adventures you know plunging into i think it's shark infested waters going through all these tribulations to bring his demanding beloved her desires and then the tagline and all because the lady loves milk tray now milk tray is this frankly rather sickly box of chocolates but again there'd be no point putting that advert out on prime time tv if those ideas didn't lurk somewhere in all our heads and the other place but i will spare you um any attempt to replicate these is of course in music not only classical but pop whenever i i, I think of dante you know a adoring Beatrice Beatrice who love for whom will ennoble him and sweep him on but he'd hard you know he'd hardly seen her he saw her passing by but nonetheless they'll always be together all I can think of and those chords sounding in my head is we'll always be together together in electric dreams again you know from Dante to Giorgio Moroder but the ideas are still with us there, I'm going to I'm going to be looking for evidence of courtly love everywhere from now on. Everything I watch. <laughs> Thank you so much. This has been such a fascinating discussion. I have sorry one last thing that I'm going to ask you, and that is for a Tudor takeaway. So I've been asking all my guests for a suggestion for something for our listeners to go off and explore after the show. So do you have a Tudor takeaway? Well, I couldn't decide. I had to, so. Can I do two? Of course you can. <laughs> well. And, and very different. The first is the letters of Elizabeth I. I mean, they're available in a very expensive hardback, wonderfully edited, but I'm sure there are a number of them are also available online. And to me, I mean, that's one of the first times when you can see so directly into a ruler's, even a, you know, a noble, a person's, a person who we all know's mind and thoughts. The other, utterly different, is the work of Brigitte Webster. Are you familiar with that? Yes, I yeah. am. She's brilliant. Yeah. So the Tudor experience, 
I very much enjoy that. Um, you know, her she has Old Hall in Norfolk, but I love doing things like following her on Twitter and seeing her 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 work, her experiments with Tudor cookery, particularly, and planting and so on, and actually seeing I've tempted to go off and try cooking some of them those those dishes that the Tudors ate and I think that kind of sensory experience is a great way of feeling that little bit closer to the Tudors absolutely and I'm so glad you mentioned her work she actually um I've had her on the podcast before she's brilliant oh, great and you know whenever I have a food question I immediately <laughs> message Brigitte she's so great and she also did a wonderful uh video lecture for us about Ooh. feeding the Tudor Queen so that's actually part of, oh, of an event I had in the last couple of months all things Tudor Queens and consorts and it was fantastic oh, filmed at her beautiful old hall which I great. love gorgeous so thank you so much and Sarah thank you so much for making time to talk tutors with us thank you i've enjoyed it well that brings us to the end of this episode of talking tutors thank you so much for joining us i absolutely love to hear from listeners so if you have any comments or suggestions or just want to say hi please get in touch with me via my website www.onthetutortrail.com where you'll also find show notes for today's episode if you've enjoyed the show please share the podcast with friends and family and don't forget to subscribe rate and review i also invite you to join our talking tutors podcast group on Facebook, where you can interact with other Tudor history lovers and hear all the behind the scenes news. You'll also find me on Twitter. My handle is on the Tudor Trail and on Instagram as the most happy 78. It's time now for us to re enter the modern world. As always, I look forward to talking Tudors with you again very soon. Mm-hmm.